All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Mashika Allgood. I'm an AI ethicist. Uh, I will look up because that's where my second screen is. Uh, um, but yes, uh, I am the founder of Ally Consulting LLC. And this talk is AI literacy is a civil rights issue. And it's part of uh, San Jose State University's Transforming Communities, a movement to racial justice program. So I think uh, we need to begin the discussion with a level set on the question, what is artificial intelligence? So the giants of AI are the primary source of our beliefs about the technology. According to them, AI will be capable of doing anything we want, answering all of our questions, solving all of our problems. AI is basically a God we create with our own two hands that will benevolently rule over us all. It is the smartest, fairest, best embodiment of all of humanity's needs, wants, and dreams without all the messy emotional and reasonableness that is humanity. Basically the best of us without the worst of us. At least that's the picture we're given. But any first year humanities student can recognize the fundamental flaws in this construction. First, you cannot build God. And if you can build it, it isn't God. Second, existence is balance. There's no good without bad, no hero without villain, no positive without negative. So it is clear that the people most invested in the growth and pro proliferation of AI have become too deeply involved to see the reality rationally, except for maybe Mr. Kahneman, uh, who seems to give a nod to the fact that there isn't a single utopian view of a God level AI in any of our art um, or movies, always dystopian. But fortunately for him, that dystopia is for future generations, so we can all relax. So all of this focus on the dream, the hype, um, the hype cycle with AI begs the question, well, what is the current reality? Well, we can turn to first year math students for that answer. AI isn't magic, it's math. And not even some complex higher order form of math that most of us have never heard of. AI is statistics. And not even college level statistics. AI is the base level statistics that we first encounter in elementary school. So for example, you're in school one day and the teacher does a survey. What is your favorite fruit? The class responses line up with 60% apple, 40% oranges. And that's what teacher writes on the board. Now the teacher asks, what is your favorite, hot dogs or hamburgers? In this class, the hamburger hot dog split mirrors the apple orange split. Now the teacher asks, what if the school decided to use these results in scheduling, lunch, in scheduling lunches? It'll serve apples with all the hamburgers and oranges with all the hot dogs. Things like this could cut food waste, right? Do you think this would work? No, the class says. Why not? Because a lot of other kids in school may not like the same things. It's, essentially, this is the explanation for data bias, taking the views of the few and extrapolating them to the whole. It's an issue we learn about in elementary school statistics, which is a foundational problem of current AI systems. But let's expand on the example, staying at the elementary level. What if two students were out sick when the teacher did the exercise? The next day they come in, and when they're asked, they say their favorite fruit is a banana. Now, how would the lunch scheduling algorithm work for them? It won't. There were no bananas when the algorithm was made, so it doesn't know anything about banana people. It may serve half of them hamburgers, half hot dogs, but it'll just be guessing. This example describes the issue of represent representativeness of data. Your AI model doesn't know what it hasn't seen. An issue raised in elementary statistics, which is a core issue of AI systems today. My point is that these issues that we see with AI aren't necessarily new or novel. They're core issues with the statistics that we can understand at an elementary age. But when we think about AI, we don't connect those ideas, but we need to make those connections. We need to understand that with all the bells and whistles, AI is just a system for looking for patterns and probabilities in data. It just does it faster and with more data than our elementary school teacher could. Given that understanding, let's look at where these probability engines are being used today. So AI is being used to make this smaller. AI has been used in critical systems uh, in our daily lives. So it's being used in law enforcement. Uh, you may have heard of predictive policing, which is trying to determine where to send the police, how many police, 
um, you know, based on historical data. Uh, immigration and Customs are using AI to decide who has a valid um, claim for asylum, you know, who should be sent back, who's lying, who's telling the truth. Uh, and then all of the data that we use in our daily lives from our Fitbits to our cell phones to Google Maps to DoorDash, all of that data is available in the Ethernet. And a lot of it gets sold and repackaged um, and bought by uh, law enforcement systems. So then you create a, a form of generalized surveillance um, where basically uh, there is data about you at almost every point in your life. And a lot of it makes its way back into uh, law, law enforcement hands and law enforcement applications. When we look at education, AI is being used to screen applicants. So determine if you should be allowed to enter this high school, this middle school, this college. Uh, it's being used to identify at risk students, and that can be negative or positive. Um, some schools have used it to provide more resources to those students early in their careers. Um, another rather notable instance was a university where they basically threw out all the freshmen who were determined at risk so that they didn't affect their scoring um, for retention at the end of the year. Um, AI is being used to determine financial aid. They call them enrollment algorithms, and basically they're supposed to determine how much financial aid that you need to be given to enroll at a school, but not necessarily how much it'll take for you to successfully graduate. And so it, it's, it's focusing on the entrance, getting you in, getting high enrollment numbers. But from a student's perspective, if that's not enough money to sustain me over time, that exacerbates the issues we have around you know, educational loans um, and people not being able to complete school. And then there's an example in uh, the UK where facial recognition is being asked or they're, they're determining whether they can use facial recognition to allow children to access free lunch. So these are middle school um, K through 12 level students where they want to take their faces and then determine based on their facial recognition if they can get free lunch that day. Employee management, uh, AI has been using, being used in efficiency software. So basically to tell you if you are moving efficiently at every point in the day. A lot of us who work from home have seen these um, or been basically forced to utilize uh, this technology, which logs our, our screen clicks and where our eyes are and noises in the background to determine if we are being efficient, um, efficiently doing our jobs all day, every day. Um, empathy tracking. Uh, there is a move to try to use AI to determine emotions. And so now AI has been sold to um, people who work um, in phone banks, uh, people who, you know, you, you call on the phone for issues and whatnot to basically tell them when they're not being empathetic enough and then present a little prompt to tell them how to be more empathetic. So the machine's telling humans how to be more humane. Um, and HR systems, both in, you know, the application process, so getting through the application process. Now we're looking at more AI in first level um, uh, interviews. And then on the back end, actually management uh, through AI. So um, the AI system determines that you have not been doing your job to a certain level, and it sends you uh, a separation letter. But in addition to these critical systems, AI has been used in housing uh, to screen renters uh, for housing appraisals. And uh, uh, one notice, uh, one method that's got, getting a lot of uh, interest right now because of the Zillow crash is uh, housing costs. So Zillow had an AI application that was determining the value of houses and ran up the value of houses over large swaths of the U.S., um, inflated them uh, with no value or with no basis, and now has gotten out of the market. But those inflated uh, prices uh, have affected you know uh, people looking for homes and in turn uh, driven up rental prices, and so. Americans are going to have to deal with the fallout of that for quite some time. Uh, social services, uh, AI is being used in uh, initial child welfare decisions. So um, deciding, you know, who should have a follow-up, you know, because they've uh, been reported to the child uh, welfare department. Uh, it's been used to try to determine unemployment fraud. And there have been some pretty massive, um, you know, 1 million people thrown off uh, in Michigan. Uh, Right before the winter, a million people thrown off uh, unemployment in California uh, because the AI system inadvertently or could not accurately determine fraud uh, at the beginning of 2020. 
Uh, it's being used for uh, workers' comp um, in education uh, or workers' comp for, for screenings. Uh, in education, uh, I believe we just discussed that one. In healthcare, uh, AI has been used for discharge determinations. So trying to figure out who's going to have, who's going to suffer uh, complications because of whatever procedure they've gone through. So who should go home and who should stay. Uh, making medical treatment decisions. So uh, health insurance, there was a, a big blow up. Uh, New York is suing a insurance company because they were using an algorithm uh, to determine you know, medical treatment that was based on how much money was spent as opposed to illness. And it heavily uh, favored uh, white people and disfavored black people. Um, and then insurance payouts. So the NFL had a lawsuit on its hands because they had a insurance um, process for determining if you had CTE, the concussion um, syndrome, and the uh, data scientists had added or basically made some dip some changes in the base score for Black people to fit the normal uh, uh, distribution, which ended up uh, basically making Black people's mental or cognitive abilities lower than white people's artificially. And so Black people had to have much uh, more significant um, uh, negative impacts of CTE in order to get paid. Um, so AI was sold into all of these systems on the promise of its ability to be more accurate and more equitable, equitable than humanity. So it's been a couple years. How's that working out for us? As AI usage advances into critical systems, the fundamental statistical issues at the core of AI systems have become apparent, not in theory, but as serious negative effects on the public. So um, employment, you see this issue of people being fired by bots. Um, you can't go and tell the bot, I couldn't deliver the package because there was a dog or there was rain or whatever other issue. Uh, if you didn't do it, you didn't do it. And that is that. And there's no one to argue. It's you against the machine. Um, so we're seeing that in a lot of gig worker situations uh, and notably across the board at Amazon. Um, so. I think we were initially sold the idea that AI would come in and take the dirty jobs that no one wanted to do, the low level jobs that we wouldn't want to get our hands dirty with. Come to find out in this particular instance, AI is actually taking middle management jobs, right? It's, it's managing this, it is a step above and we are actually below. Um, in healthcare, uh, an algorithm blocked kidney transplants to black patients because developers did not have, um, the, the, the data didn't add up to nice, pretty normal distribution. And so they just added 16 points to the black person, black people's base score uh, in order to even out the distribution. Well, in reality, just like with the CTE um, situation, that translated into black people having um, inflated, um, inflated um, kidney um, kid, um, functioning. So not based on any kind of medical differences between black people and white people, um, just because of the, the data science, um, black people had to now be much, much sicker in order to get any kind of kidney intervention or kidney, kidney care. Um, this upcoming war on, on algorithms is uh, credit scoring algorithms, eligibility for services, housing, employment, um, all of those algorithms kind of work together in a net uh, to keep people, um, you know, in this, this circle of poverty. So you land in a bad situation and then all the algorithms just kind of kind of continue to um, become a, a perpetuating cycle, right? So uh, you have bad credit, so you can't get this job. You can't get this job, so you can't get this housing. You can't get this housing, you're not supposed to get these services. And if there's an error in any of them, it, you, you can't necessarily fix it or you can't really fix it. Even if there isn't an error, they just keep feeding on each other and making it much harder for you to climb out of your situation. Um, this heat listed is an, is a, an expose uh, about a man named Robert McDaniel in Chicago, who in 2013, a group of police came to his door and said, we have this algorithm that based on where you live, who you know who's been involved in violent crime, um, we believe that you're gonna be involved in violent crime either as a victim or as a perpetrator. So this one person we brought is a social worker and they will give you some pamphlets, but the rest of us believe that you're gonna be a perpetrator. And so we're going to harass you and surveil you um, ad nauseum until we figure out which one you are. Um, basically minority report. So 
They spent the next basically four years uh, harassing this man at every turn. Um, eventually, uh, you know, the the issue was when they came to his house with that many police officers in a neighborhood where police don't come to your house and then go away. Um, the community didn't understand this minority report type thing, this technology, and he had no language to explain it to them. And so then he was tagged a snitch. And so he became persona non grata within his community and ended up actually being shot twice uh, because his community thought that he had been snitching for years uh, to the police. Um, this article about education, predictive policing, it, it, the, the number one um, uh, predictor of uh, recidivism in predictive, uh, in, in predictive algorithms is age. And so when you start looking at how that's going to be used, uh, eventually it, it made it down to the middle school level, right? Because you know kids who have interactions with the police at that level, they're at that age, are more likely to have interactions with police in the future. And so there's a particular county in Florida who used this uh, technology, this, this uh, predictive policing, and created a campaign basically to run any of the children who were, who were um, designated by this algorithm to run them and their families out of the county. And so consistent perpetual harassment. And it was required of the police officers. So <clears throat> it, it's, it's a systemic thing, right? So it's not just that this was a bad algorithm, but an algorithm is a part of a larger system, right? And so used within the system in this way, uh, it was used to terrorize families to try to push them out of the county so that that negative um, impact wouldn't be felt when the child got older and assume, you know, we assume that they became a criminal at some point. Um, so all of our efforts to break the school to prison pipeline <laughs> and now AI is being used to expand it and permanently embed it in the educational structure. Um, and then uh, we're looking in the automotive because we, we talk a lot about self-driving cars now. I'm not going to get into, into Tesla at all, um, but we're, we'll look at an example from Uber. Um, a couple of years ago, Uber's self-driving car killed a pedestrian. Um, the self-driving car, the, the, the algorithm couldn't determine what the woman was. It couldn't determine if it was a person, if it was a car, um, if it was, it, it went through trying to figure out what she was. And we've known since 2019 that um, self-driving systems have difficulty uh, detecting darker skinned people. And so that, that's part of the problem, um, but it couldn't figure out who she was. Uh, but the system had been set up to where at some point it gives up. And when it gives up, the driver's supposed to take over. Well, the system had no driver warning when it quit. So it just gave up and it didn't, it didn't flash. There was no light, uh, no, no notice, nothing, right? Um, then it didn't have any kind of buffer timing for the decision-making process, right? So how much time does it need to give the driver to act after it quits? It didn't have that kind of timing. Uh, and then the, um, as you can see, the developers had turned off emergency braking because it was creating a herky-jerky drive. So the car itself would have stopped if they hadn't cut off ABS, but they had. So all of these systems come together and basically the, the system quit with 1.3 seconds uh, before it was going to hit uh, the pedestrian. So obviously the person who was driving the car was not paying attention, but even if they were, 1.3 seconds is not a reasonable decision-making time for a human. But in any case, um, the pedestrian died. The only person who went to jail, the people who were making hundreds of thousands of dollars to design these systems and put them out into society, None of them received any consequences. The only person who went to jail for this was the person who gets paid $20 an hour to sit in the seat. So these are the kinds of things that we're starting to see more and more of as we continue to push out AI into these, into these um, critical systems uh, in, in, US, in society. So there are also a couple of documentaries that highlight uh, some of these issues. So Coded Bias is Joy um, uh discussion on facial recognition systems. And then the social dilemma is interesting in that it deeply explains how uh, the person who shot uh, the individuals in the, in the South Carolina church uh, was radicalized through Google searches. Uh, and so this idea that Google is neutral is not founded on any actual facts, just marketing. So all of this before we even get to Facebook. So the question is, well, all right, this is all really bad stuff, right? Um, but obviously everything isn't bad and there are good people who are trying to do this work. So why can't they just fix the models? 
And really, it, a lot of it comes down to data. So what AI does is it matches. It determines what class you belong to in its data set. So I look at the training data I've been getting, I've been given, which of these groups are you most like? And then I'm going to treat you like that group. So what it's doing is treating you like what it has already seen, right? Which means that it can only work with what it's seen. And so that training data is the world to the AI. Well, think of our data. Think of who we are as a society. Our data is our bias, right? Um, the AI can't rise above that. And then you can't eliminate that bias because if you eliminate the bias in data, there's no value to the data, right? If all the data is the exact same data point, there's no value. So it's not an issue of eliminating bias, it's the fact that the bias is there and how do we address it, right? Um, another issue is AI needs massive data sets. And this is part of the reason why there is so much bias in data is because minorities are not well represented either in numbers or in actual representation online. And so you're often not gonna get um, enough of you know, the data for different types of groups in order for the, the algorithm to, to learn to treat them um, the way that you, you know, in a, in a fair and equitable way. Um, and even if you do get that data, it's typically biased in some kind of way. If you think of how, you know, the data you see about different minority groups on social media, that's essentially what we're stuck with, right? And finally, we're stuck with what we have. So we actually don't understand a lot about how bias is encoded in data. Uh, there's a new, um, research paper that came out that said that AI, or that showed that AI can determine race and radiology, like an X-rays, and X-rays that are so degraded that we can't even tell what part of the body this X-ray is supposed to be on, even if there's an X-ray in the shot. The AI can still determine race. So we don't understand enough about how race or bias or gender or you know, all these other minority factors are encoded in data uh, to create unbiased data sets or to, you know, um, adequately pull the wrong types of bias out of data sets. And really what it comes down to is this is all experimental. Like there's no one person with a vision driving where we're going with AI. Um, and there's no understanding of what is happening before it happens. Um, you know, the, the systems are too complex for us to understand all the nuances or implications. Uh, so all we're really doing is reacting. You know, we're patching problems as they appear. But, you know, even understanding all of this, you know, there are people making decision, decisions, right? People are making these systems. So they should consider the people who could possibly be hurt when they're developing these systems, right? And so that's kind of how our mind goes. And then we start looking at developers as people with bad intentions, right? And so why are they not looking at people um, when they're making their decisions? And that comes back to our initial point. Um, demonizing the engineer isn't fair, um, and it doesn't fix the crux of the problem. The real decision here is who's actually making these decisions, right? Um, if it's a developer, this is what they're making their decisions based on, right? So we've created this mystique around AI that argues that you can only be involved in the conversation if you're a tech expert, you know, basically shutting down the normal decision makers in an, org in an organization and then shutting them out of the conversation. So the folks who we trust to make decisions based on values, harm, and vision, um, either they tap out or they don't feel empowered to have a say in the overwhelming number of decisions that are made throughout the AI design, development, and deployment process, right? So, you know, people, I don't know anything about AI, so I'm just going to leave it to the developers. Well, when you do that, what you're seeing in front of you, this is how developers make AI decisions. They use statistics. The decisions are determined based on these lines and dots in a chart. So when we're talking about the CTE and the kidney um, functionality, uh, the first thing you're looking at if I'm a data scientist is does the data distribution fit into this shape of a normal distribution um, chart right here, right? This normal distribution makes the math really easy when it comes to AI. And so I'm trying to fit as much of my data into that normal distribution as possible. So if it doesn't naturally fit into that funnel, what do I do? I add a few points, I take away a few points, right? That's what I'm looking at is this distribution. How that works out in reality is now people can't get kidney um, transplants when they should, okay? When I'm trying to determine if this AI, like at the confidence level, if, if, it's, if it's generalized or if the confidence level is, is good enough to where it's giving me 
the right mix uh, or the closest to accuracy that I can find. We look at that, it's called this um, RLC curve, right? So the perfect classifier is this dot over here. Well, what am I looking at? I get a printout of different confidence levels with these lines. And I'm just looking for the line that's closest to the dot. If this line is closest to this dot, then that's the best confidence level for me to do my job, right? Uh, if I'm trying to figure out, well, which model is best? Which model should I go with? Then I'm looking at area under the curve. And that's basically, is this shaded area closer to here and cover more of this area than this shaded area? And if this is the shaded area, this is the model that I choose. This model should generalize because it's closer to this shaded area, right? Um, I mean, this, this model is most accurate because it's, it's closer to the shaded area. And then if I'm trying to say, well, will my model generalize or is it too specific or not specific enough? Then I'm looking at, is it the optimal fit? Does it under or overfit or is it the optimal fit? Well, what am I looking at? Are the dots clustered around this line or are the lines close enough together with a little bit of, you know, this is, this is how decision-making happens um, when I'm making decisions based on uh, data science. So no names, no faces, no stories. None of the things that we require human decision makers to consider in every other aspect of our lives. Entire life and societal trajectories decided by charts and, and graphs. So that's what we do when we throw our hands up and absolve ourselves of any responsibility for these issues. We leave it to engineers to solve it through the lens that they understand, which is in no way the type of decision making processes society expects or requires. So that's why this discussion is so important because we all need to be empowered to play a role in the AI decision-making process. Yes, there are seriously complicated technical questions when it comes to the math and programming involved in creating AI systems. But the key concerns which the tech, um, with the tech are founded in basic statistics. Math we can all understand, issues we can all have a say in. So recognizing that AI is statistics with all the flaws and inconsistencies inherent to statistical processes that we intuitively understand empowers us to ask ourselves and others, first, is AI the right tool for these life and death decisions? Should we really be relying on lines and shading to decide who lives and dies, who is jailed and who goes free, who gets a job and who's destitute and so on? It also empowers us to ask more questions about who should ultimately be involved and the key decision-making processes around AI. As long as those decision-making processes continue to be primarily insular to the companies who are building and funding the tech, the answers to the big life and society altering questions will always be more AI and more of the best tech can do right now, whether or not it's actually good enough. But this conversation and my work with Ally Consulting is an effort to broaden that decision-making circle. We all have a role to play in ensuring that the primary focus and result of the use of AI in society is the betterment of our societies as a whole and of our individual lives. We are all in a position to incentivize and encourage the use of effective and ethical AI and to disincentivize and discourage the use of ineffective and unethical AI. How? Well, let's take a look at the various roles we play in society and some of the questions we can consider within those roles. So I talk about everyday activism, which is basically within the role that you are given, how can you do things day to day to help make a better and fairer AI society? So if I'm an AI stakeholder, first thing I need to ask is, have you seriously evaluated non-AI solutions? AI is not always the answer. Oftentimes it's not the best answer, even if it is an answer, right? So have you taken the time to look at other solutions? Are you using AI because it's the best solution or is it because it's cool or what somebody else really wants to use right now? Is the AI system intended to make determinations about life, health, liberty, or opportunity? Uh, if it is, then there are some checkpoints you probably want, sorry. There are some checkpoints you probably want to ask about, right? There are some um, social issues that you want to consider. There are some things that you need to be sharing with engineering, providing them context so that they don't um, you know, create a system that doesn't meet the value system uh, that is expected by society or your customers or the people who will ultimately be um, impacted by the technology. Have experts, customers, or end users vetted the problem, methodology, or solution? So you should be setting checkpoints throughout the product lifecycle. So the initial check-in should happen before the project is funded. 
So before you spend any money, before people say, oh, it's sunk costs, you need to go ahead and vet, you know, is the solution going to solve your problem? Because a lot of times we solve the problem we think customers have or users have, but it's not actually the problem they want solved. So before you create an AI system that is massively expensive and, and can cause harm, make sure you're actually asking the right questions and providing the right solutions. Um, next, have you vetted your accuracy and fairness expectations directly with engineering and your customers? A lot of time, the people who are business owners, the people who are stakeholders around AI who aren't engineering have expectations for accuracy and fairness. And they just assume that engineering has those same expectations. But that's not necessarily the case. When the COMPAS algorithm, which is used to determine recidivism and determine sentencing in the law, um, when it came out with its predictive accuracy, uh, predictive accuracy was 67 to 72%. Um, for, for the most part, which means that it, or the, the confidence score. So it meant that it was a little bit better than 50-50. I believe if you have asked uh, if, the, if lawyers were involved, they might've had a higher, um, a higher bar for what they thought would be a legitimate um, predictive accuracy, right? And so you wanna make sure that if someone is building, if you're part of a process where something is being built, um, that you understand you know, what the engineering team thinks is legitimate as opposed to what you think is legitimate um, so that there isn't a disconnect and, and things uh, don't, don't end up the way that you intend. Um, and then finally, what data is being collected, right? Um, how is it all like directly useful right now? How long will it be kept? Uh, and who will have access? So it, this is important for privacy and, privacy and security. Uh, obviously, uh, data breaches are brutal, um, but it's also important for storage costs. As a business owner, you know, as part of this stakeholder group, you want to consider um, this whole idea of data lakes is gone. Like, you don't just collect all the data all the time. You want to collect what is necessary, and you want to collect it and keep it for the amount of time necessary for that purpose. And in addition to it just being good business practice, you're starting to see legislation that's requiring that. Um, specifically coming out of the EU and even out of China. Now, if I am an AI developer, which uh, largely I lean to software engineering, um, uh, these are some of the things that I would, I would be asking. Uh, first, uh, is the engineering culture uh, within your organization appropriately cautious? So there is a, an issue now with engineering over-promising and under-delivering. Under so once again, we see that happen with Zillow. Now, obviously, business has a responsibility to vet what you promised. You know, product management has a responsibility to make sure you're delivering over the course of time. But when things go horribly wrong, the engineering department suffers. So the first people to get axed with at Zillow was the entire engineering department, <laughs> the, the entire group that built out that system. So yes, other people have responsibility, but it's your job on the line. So you wanna create an engineering culture that under promises and over delivers, always over deliver. But I believe the time for the hype cycle in AI is over because engineering is gonna to have to start paying the cost of that hype cycle with their jobs and their careers because after you take that hit, uh, it, it definitely will follow you for some time. Second question you wanna ask is what role are the arts and sciences playing in your educational journey? because a lot of the issues with AI are driven by lack of context. Um, AI is not just um, a technical uh, endeavor. AI is a social engineering system. So now developers are social engineers. So uh, you need to consider the fact that you're gonna need to know more than just your technical um, expertise. Uh, nowadays, you're building systems that are doing more they're not just widgets anymore, right? They're changing the course of society. So you need to have a better understanding of, of what's going on within society. Um, next, how important is accuracy and what accuracy measurements uh, correlate to the accuracy uh, required? Oh, and let me, before I move on, uh, things that you might wanna consider educational opportunities are being uh, requiring your school to give you educational opportunities. Um, for I would say our education in history, philosophy, anthropology, and sociology. Um, and then once you get into the actual job realm, you should uh, be looking for an atmosphere of cross-functional cooperation. 
So a place where you can actively seek out subject matter experts to broaden your body of knowledge. Because once again, when it comes down to it, it's going to be what did you know? And you can't know everything, but you do want a baseline in most things. So you know who to ask and what to ask. And then you want to work in a, in a company that allows you or that gives you that flexibility to reach out to those people and get the information you need when you need it. So moving back to accuracy and accuracy measurements, um, we all know there are a variety of ways to calculate accuracy and it matters for a lot of applications, um, you know, whether you are doing a type one or a type two area, error. So you need to understand that. Um, and then you also need to understand for your application, what about fairness? There are something like 28 different fairness metrics, right? There are metrics to measure individual fairness, group fairness, fairness at the intersection. So people who are, you know, cross sections of two or three different minorities, there are ways to measure that now, right? And then there's, you know, differences between if I measure within a small group as opposed to if I measure within the whole, does that, does that disparity go away or does it stay? So there's a lot of research being done in this area, um, but you need to know um, some of the basics and start asking these questions about, you know, what will be required of you for your applications. Um, and career-wise, and, and the projects you're taking on, are you focused on innovation or incremental progress? Because incremental progress is important for cementing your understanding of technical skills, but, you know, actually your, your data science, computer science is more than that, right? So you need to require more of the organizations that are running these challenges and publishing AI research because an incremental you know, accuracy boost doesn't move the field at all, right? Um, and it doesn't help engineering out of some of these difficult situations it's finding itself in when it comes to these social issues around AI. So innovation, um, which is what a lot of people go into, into these sciences for, uh, needs to become a greater focus you know, once you leave the educational realm. And then finally, uh, while you're still in education, are you learning best practices that are directly translatable to the real world? So a lot of uh, data science and engineering or computer, uh, software engineering um, education provides, you know, they're, they're just trying to teach you the skill. So you get sanitized data sets that are stripped of context. Um, but that's not how life works in reality, right? You're never going to get a clean data set. And, and context is everything. So what you need to be getting is problematic data sets with value contradictions and competing interests, because you're not going to just be crafting technical solutions. You're solving actual problems for actual people. That's a heavy burden. Uh, I think uh, at this point, um, the field needs to accept it and start preparing uh, new entrants for this new burden. Uh, educational professionals, specifically those working in the K through 12 room. Um, you want to start asking what role does evaluation or subjective data play in model decision making? So we had discussed um, earlier about AI being used to determine um, if students are going to be successful at different levels of education. Well, is there any subjective data in that? Because we know historically that, you know, certain groups, particularly Black uh, girls, are often um, penal uh, penalized for um, disruptions in the classroom way more than other people, right? So um, subjectively, they're just assumed to have, you know, engaged in more egregious behavior, even though objectively the research shows that they haven't. Well, if that subjective data makes it into the AI, into the algorithms, then now, you know, you're, you're doubly penalizing and cementing uh, that, that penalizing um, into that, that young person's future, right? Um, and that's just one example. There's a lot of different subjective data that you're going to get while you're teaching, uh, I taught seventh grade, and yeah, I you're not perfect. Some days are some days are better than others, but I did make an effort to you know be as fair as possible. Um, but I I've run into situations you know working with young people where a teacher is not putting the proper things on paperwork, um, you know on um, uh, information that goes home to the parents and is kept you know in the record. And so that subjective data, which we all know can be hit or miss is that working its way into models when they're making decisions about students. Um, are models decisions explainable? Um, and not just explainable, interpretable, right? So I needed to tell me why it made the decision um, or what basis it made the decision on and why that basis was legitimate, right? Uh, and then what is the recourse or corrective process for poor decisions and incorrect data? Uh, these are children. This is an entire life that this can compound. So if something's wrong at the fourth grade, 
uh, we need to fix it in the fourth grade, right? We need to find a way to to make that happen. So is that happening uh, in your when AI is being applied at your level? Um, how's the model tuned for benefits versus punishment or negative labels? So is the model tuned to over include students when granting benefits and under include them when doing punishments or ne or when negative labels are applied? Because I believe that's the value system that we prefer. But is that discussion being had? Uh, what information is being collected and aggregated? Who has access to it and for what purposes? So we talked about facial recognition being used for you know, school lunches. Well, who's going to have access to that? Because I can't change my face. And so if someone is packaging that information and it, and it you know, moves into a realm that's not positive, then that child has lost their face for the rest of their life. They're going to be battling over their identity for the rest of their life. So we need to be very, very careful about you know, who is what data we're collecting, who has access to it, and for what purposes, particularly with children who are not in a position to, to fight for these things themselves. And then, you know, AI, you know, may seem like a broad, um, you know, uh, international type of thing, but it's a local thing, right? Local data is important. You know, local application is what matters. So we're local teachers, parents, or administrators involved in the internal design or testing. How do you know it will work within your system if no one within your system has had anything to do with it? All right, adult students. Um, so uh, first question I'd ask is, is AI infused in your curriculum or is it a separate pursuit? So I think we're at a point that requires a rethink of um, adult educational curriculums in the light of the pervasiveness of AI. So AI knowledge will be necessary in every industry. Every single industry you pursue has some sort of AI application. And you have a right to an education that prepares you to be a part of this conversation. So instead of having an AI class here or there, um, you know, educational systems need to be rethinking how they infuse AI into every part of the curriculum. I, I'm not talking coding. I'm not talking making everybody an engineer. But, you know, AI applications are involved and so we need to be able to critically think around them and that needs to be involved in your education no matter what uh, career that you're pursuing or pursuit that you have uh, in, in college. Um, I'd be asking what data is the school collecting and what is it being used for? So um, I'm aware like a lot of us have are doing virtual or we're doing this on virtual but we're doing virtual schooling and some of these virtual platform, uh, these online platforms have scoring processes for, let's say, a participation score, right, for your virtual learning platform. Well, you know, I, I spoke to a teacher who was saying, you know, the platform said that this student had a low participation score, but they contact me in office hours and we talk like almost every week and they send me emails. But this learning platform is scoring them low because they're not, you know, making comments in the actual classroom setting. Well, where is that being used? Because if that data follows you to, do you get into graduate school? That would be problematic, right? But you don't know until you ask. And so that would be something that I'd be asking. Um, are there sufficient security and privacy measures along the entirety of the data pipeline? So a lot of times we look at, oh, well, the, when it was collected, it was secure. Okay, well, where is it being stored? You know, who else has access to it? You know, we find out a lot of times that you know, there's, there's data breaches because a vendor, you know, left something, you know, or, or a contractor, you know, was in the system with a, you know, one, two, three, four passwords, something of that nature. Um, but yeah, you know, trying to keep your data uh, secure and private is of ultimate importance in today's data-driven age. Um, how much non-tech research funding is available for AI researchers? So the vast majority of AI funding is provided by tech companies. And because they provide so much funding, they heavily influence the type of research that's being performed um, and they focus it on very narrow areas and this whole incremental gains because those are beneficial to industry. So I would be asking as a student, you know, who's funding our AI research at this university and how do we um, make that funding more equitable, more open and involve more voices in the conversation so that people aren't forced you know, to push their research into these very, very narrow bands in order to get funded. And then finally, a question that we don't really talk about, but data centers are not carbon neutral. They pump out carbon emissions like it's their job. And we're not having that conversation. So 
there was a lot of conversation maybe 10, 20 years ago about defunding around oil and gas, right? As a part of us trying to move towards a cleaner society. But no one's, you know, hitting colleges about how much carbon is being emitted by the AI systems, you know, that are being used within the college and to support the college. Um, and are those costs uh, being offset? Are they being included in the carbon neutral pledges? Like we don't have any data. So if you don't know, you know, what's going on, then how can you understand and plan for it? And then the final group I wanna talk about uh, is social activists. So um, yeah, so first thing we need to know is where AI is being used uh, in communities, both public and private. So the one thing you find out when you get into like looking at this AI stuff is that the companies that are doing the most uh, and that are the most pervasive in, in the social and our critical systems are the companies you've never heard of. So we hear a lot about Facebook, but Facebook is social media. Um, it has a couple inroads here and there, but the companies that are really doing a lot of work, uh, you know, when it comes to working with universities, working with um, you know, law enforcement for surveillance tech, uh, you know, providing healthcare algorithms, you don't hear their names. You don't know who they are and they're not advertised. And so uh, it's really important to start asking where AI has been used uh, and getting an accounting. So I found one, one study in 2019 that had an accounting of where the federal government was thinking or federal um, governmental entities were thinking about using AI. And that was it, no, but it, it didn't list company names. It was just, you know, this is what we can find right now. So this information is not freely given and people need to start asking. Um, once again, how much carbon will be emitted by these AI systems that your community is using, um, both in the contract, uh, during the contract term and the training. So we often think, oh, well, after it's trained, the AI is, is clean. Actually, it emits 80% or it, it requires 80% of the energy after it's been trained. So the training process is a highly energy intense process, right? Um, but the maintenance process is just as energy intense, if not more, and it goes for longer. And so we, we tend to think you get an AI system, it, it, it handles it and you're good to go. But AI is constantly training. So it's running that training process over and over, iterating thousands and thousands of times until you know the, the contract ends. So until you pull it out of production. So it's heavily carbon emitting. Um, and so questions you need to ask. Um, and then when you're looking at AI systems and if they're, you know, um, if they're being used fairly, uh, people a, a lot of times want to talk about consent. Well, you consented. Okay, but is the power imbalance significant enough to make withholding consent unreasonable? So we talked about school lunches, right? If the parents withhold consent for facial recognition for their children, then their children don't eat. Is that a reasonable um, consent? Uh, can we say that they actively consented? Uh, the United Nations right now is using iris scans for refugees to obtain services. Well, can they not consent? Like, is that legitimate? And even if I get out of, you know, the critical um, social sphere, let's just move into the business sphere. Can I work internationally and not consent to Google Docs or OneDrive? Like, is, you know, is there, is there um, any other balance of power that will allow me to do the kind of work I want to do? Um, without being forced into these small silos. And for those of you who are, oh, but you know, they're a big business and that's their job, they got that way by, you know, with, with decisions that they made, right, to, to gobble up smaller competitors. So the fact that there's no competition in the market um, and, and puts us in this position of, of not being able to consent or not consent uh, is an is a issue that needs to be probed. Um, next, uh, if AI systems are being used, um, then you want to know what's the recourse or corrective process for bad uh, AI decisions uh, and incorrect data. Because, you know, if you try to change something on your, on your uh, credit report right now, um, you may change it briefly, but if it doesn't go through in the right way at the right time, all the other credit reports will still pick up the bad data and you'll end up back where you started. So that's already a problem with our current systems. AI systems don't do that any better. And so when data gets packaged or resold and moved here and moved there, then you're still in a situation where you're getting, you know, those, those errors uh, repopulated. And so there, when you're looking to, you know, uh, enact an AI system that's gonna affect uh, communities, you wanna look at, do you have a real process to correct um, incorrect data 
or uh, or bad decisions, and if there's any kind of rec recourse for people who have been harmed. Uh, and then finally, uh, what individual or role is responsible when an AI system injures a person or a community? So is there is there a person on the hook? Because right now, as you see, we're we're pointing out all these issues with the AI, um, but when it came down to the Uber example, the only person on the hook was the only was the person in the car, and that's because that's the law, you know, faults the person in the car, and so there wasn't really an understanding of how do we how do we you know provide recourse or how do we um, you know look at someone else uh, being held responsible uh, for this particular action. And you're getting a fair amount of that with AI. Who do we hold responsible? And so I think if you're looking at AI in a community sense, um, you might want to start uh, having a conversation about, well, you want to bring the system in here, but who's going to be held responsible uh, if something goes wrong? So those are just a few ways that um, or, or questions you can ask and, and different things that you can consider in the course of your normal job or your normal role in society. Um, that will help make a difference in the AI conversation. So AI literacy, the knowledge of, you know, what AI is, its limitations, um, you know, and, and what, it's, what it's best suited for, allows us all the opportunity to become everyday activists, empowering us to make positive changes in AI through our normal everyday um, living. So with that, uh, this is basically a call to action to get educated, right? Um, so. I put a couple of sources here, the Foundation for Best Practices in Machine Learning. So a lot that you hear about AI and AI ethics is frameworks and operational guidelines, or they're really high level um, things that don't really translate into engineering practices. And so this group, Foundation for Best Practices in, in ML, I'm, I'm part of this group, uh, but we've worked together to create open source technical and organizational guidelines. So there are two separate guidelines, one for organizations and how to set up your organization for best and ethical AI practices. And the other one, specific technical guidelines on how to build AI ethically. Um, so that link uh, is, is live uh, and you can use that uh, when the presentation becomes available. Um, and then the other two are shameless plugs for my ally work. Um, uh, the ally ed classroom is, um, where I provide uh, educational resources, um, hopefully uh, that are accessible to all. Uh, I have a program, AI for Educators, that um, should begin uh, work this summer, providing courses for teachers, um, like middle school and high school teachers, for them to understand AI, instead of just giving them a curriculum and saying, oh, teach this thing, but allowing them to get a, a fundamental understanding of the technology so that they are better suited um, to bring this knowledge into their courses. Um, I provide free AI ethics courses, um, which are basically no fee lectures on a wide variety of issues um, in the areas of AI ethics, data privacy, and security. I post those uh, as, as free courses in the AI ally classroom. And I also have a series that is coming out at the beginning of the year for attorneys. It's AI for legal professionals. And so to provide them an understanding of how the tech is actually influencing the law um, and allow them to be prepared for practicing law uh, and in the 21st century. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank SJSU for gracious, graciously hosting this event as part of the Transforming Communities, a Movement to Racial Justice Program. I'd like to thank everyone in attendance for your time and interest. Uh, and with that, I will stop screen sharing. And I think we have a couple minutes if anyone wants to ask any questions.